CIRA is a world famous consulting group on uh, energy fields or oil fields and uh, provides consulting to the oil companies. And they uh, recently did an in depth report of uh, depletion rates of different uh, oil, or of, of the kind of some oil fields in the world. They looked at the 811 largest oil fields, and what they found is that on average, across all those fields, their output declines 4.5% a year. That doesn't sound too bad, right? Well, if we're consuming 85 million barrels a day, then that's 3.8 million barrels a day of production that disappears every year, which means every two and a half years we need to find a new Saudi Arabia. I haven't found any of those lately, like 30 years. Um, they had more rapid decline rates in smaller fields, and all the new fields we're finding are the smaller ones, which means their production will drop off even faster. And uh, deep water projects also show more rapid declines, and again, that's where all the development is happening, because that's the remaining oil that we haven't sucked out of the earth yet. Um, this, I think, is the same graph uh, you saw earlier. This is the ASPO analysis of uh, peak uh, production of different countries, uh, the Middle East uh, being one of the last places to peak, and a peak happening right around 2008. Um, there's a reason, well, this is a very optimistic Hubbard curve. Uh, so they took the USGS uh, analysis of the total amount of oil that might be in the world, where they think there's 3,000 trillion barrels who've burned a trillion. Um, I'm sorry, 3,000 billion, which is 3 trillion. We've burned a, a third of that. And, uh, you know, extending the rapid growth in consumption that we, uh, I mean, the world wants our lifestyle, right? What country uh, purchased more cars than any other in the world last year? <laughs> yeah. They want to live like we do. It's not going to happen. They're going to be very disturbed by that when they realize it. Anyway, this is a peak in 2016. And this is the really optimistic projection. My point here is that this is not our children's problem. This is here now. A number of uh, experts have predicted when the peak of global oil production will happen. Campbell in 1997 said 2005. Uh, DeFay in 2001 said sometime between 2003 2009. Duncan said 2006. Uh, these are all um, retired petroleum geologists. Uh, the IEA in 1998 said, well, sometime between 2010 and 2020. That seemed like a long time away back then. British Petroleum actually acknowledges this will happen sometime in the next decade. Um, Shell Oil, uh, they're uh, still blowing smoke, uh, along with the, the USGS. Um, so back in 2005, the Canadian Investment Bank Corporation you know those radical leftist bankers? You know, they're, they're always saying go green. And, but um, they uh, foresaw this, and they said there's going to be this shortfall in oil production. And as a result, the price of oil is going to go up. Now, in two th at the time, oil was like $40 a barrel, right? And they said, well, it's going to go to 61 and then 70 and then 80 And I've been tracking this ever since about what the actuals were. So the average price of oil in, in 2006 was $66, somewhat above their estimate, 72 in 2007, just above their estimate. 2008, we had that blow off oil hit 150 bucks briefly, 147. And, uh, you know, this year, after the worst recession of our lifetimes, unless there's a few of you here that are older than me, um, you know, oil drops down and the average price in 2009 was $62 a barrel. If you had gone out publicly in, let's say, 2003 and said oil was going to be $62 a barrel in 2009, people would have laughed at you. But now that's the low price, right? Oil prices decline in recessions because demand is destroyed, because people aren't driving to work, because they're unemployed. If you read articles, they talk about demand destruction. That's a, an economist term. Uh, what you can hear when you hear demand destruction is unemployment. And there's reason to think that peak, uh, the peak of global oil production has already occurred. That it's in the rear view mirror, we can't be sure. I'd give it two thirds odds, maybe one third. Gee, we actually managed to pump a little more in one of the forthcoming years here. But we're about there. Uh, whether the peak was, was 2005 or 2008, if you look at the um, monthly figures, there was a, a high month in July in 2008. 
doesn't exactly matter. People get into this and they want to argue about it. And it's like, you know, whether it was 2005, 2008, or whether it was 2014, we're in trouble. So even as the oil price was skyrocketing, because this is the other economist thing, well, you know, we'll get price signals and then supply will expand. Well, the price skyrocketed, right? And production didn't increase. Now, the decrease here is demand destruction, but across here, demand was hot. And we didn't manage to find more. There, there's, you know, you can't find what isn't there, no matter what technology you use. Hey, John. Yes. Um, I'm curious about this, uh, this discovery process. They, um, the naysayers of peak oil will frequently state that uh, the notion of environmental legislation is actually blocking our efforts to search for more oil. Oh, yes. So every crisis needs at least one scapegoat, maybe three or four. Um, there is always a fight over whose fault it was. And let's just look at the recent banking crisis, right? How many different theories have we heard about this? How many new regulations have we passed to make sure it didn't happen again? Mm -hmm. oh, that would be zero. Um, <laughs> and that's the purpose of the argument, right? You throw out 20 different reasons that might have happened, then if you can't agree on the reason, you certainly can't agree on the solution. So the oil companies will tell you that uh, if oil production isn't increasing, that's the environmentalist's fault, because they won't let them drill anywhere that they want to. And there's some oil on the uh, continental shelf that we could get to with drilling and in Anwar, and I'm sure we will. Because when unemployment hits 20%, no one will care where you're drilling. When gasoline is rationed, the hue and cry will go up and say, drill, baby, drill. Gee, I think we did hear that. <laughs> this didn't quite become legislation, but it was close, right? Next time around, it'll happen. And that will be significant for reducing the steepness of the decline but the quantities involved, if you look at the numbers, and I don't have time to go through them all, but I have, they're just not big enough. It's not going to restore the heyday of oil plenty. Yeah, thanks for that. So we had a big spike in oil prices in the 70s, and we uh, had some very useful reactions to that. Uh, so I looked at oil in 1978 and oil in 1982. Between those two points in time, the price of oil went up 283%. And our oil use and how that changed across just that period of four years because of that price spike. And, you know, we reduced the oil we used in transportation by 8%. And that was, you know, for those old of us old enough to remember, we had carpooling, we went to smaller cars, we passed the cafe standard. There was high unemployment and people weren't working and therefore not driving to work. Um, a lot like now, actually. Uh, but the big changes we made were we used to burn oil to heat our houses. Lots of people had oil-fired furnaces. A few people still do, but not so many. Uh, we quit burning oil to heat commercial buildings, and we especially quit burning oil to generate electric power, except in some remote places like Hawaii and the Keys. Um, we switched those over to natural gas, we switched those over to coal, we switched those to nuclear. During the 70s, we were turning up nuclear power plants like crazy, right? Those were the easy shifts to do. Those were all stationary uses of oil. And we shifted those to other things because we could, and what's really hard to change is vehicles. And so we can't do that again, right? We, we already played that card, it's out of our hand. Um, we'll do some more of that, but there's not a lot more to do. Um, oil uh, transportation is now two-thirds of our oil use and most of that is in light vehicles as in the cars we drive, uh, heavy trucks, air transportation, um, actually uh, yeah, water transportation or ships, actually pushing stuff through pipelines, motorcycle, rail, right, but it's all oil powered. And so this next time around we can't just stop using oil for heating and electric power generation, we're going to have to address the transportation issue. And at the core of the transportation issue, and rarely talked about, this has got to be like the best kept secret in the country, is vehicle miles travel. We just keep driving more and more and more and more and more. Everybody talks about the fuel economy of cars, but the changes in fuel economy and miles per gallon have been dwarfed by the increase in the number of miles we drive. And it's just been this uh, astonishing climb with these tiny little dips during the massive oil crises. And then now we've actually had a, a noticeable dip. Uh, why? Well, because we're in a recession. People aren't driving as much. Um, we, 
and, and, and this was addressed in the earlier talk, right? This is sort of Jevons' paradox. If we make the cars way more efficient, then we'll drive them further. Hey, I've got a Prius. I'll, you know, buzz across the state. It's no big deal, right? 